There we go. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Hancock. Welcome to this month's uh, May 2019's Lunch and Learn for Humanistic Management Professionals. I am Jennifer Hancock, founder of Humanist Learning Systems. I want to introduce my colleague, Elizabeth Castillo. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Castillo out at Arizona State University. Thank you so much for joining us today. So today we have Kristen Sherry with us and she's gonna be talking about how to onboard people and develop people with dignity. Now, Kristen is a three-time author, speaker, managing partner of UMAP LLC, which is her new book, and creator of the UMAP profile. Kristen certifies professionals in UMAP, a holistic self-discovery tool that uncovers a person's strengths, values, preferred skills, and interests. Formally, Kristen was a learning and development leader for a Fortune 20 company where she led the learning strategy and delivery and coached leaders and their teams. Her recent book, UMAP, Find Yourself, Blaze Your Path, Show the World, launched in November in 2018 and released as a number one Amazon category bestseller in the USA, Canada, and the UK, and was named to Indie Reader's Best Reviewed Book List in 2019. She speaks at conferences globally and has been a featured career expert on Wharton Business Radio's Career Talk, Kristen, we are so excited to have you on. I am thrilled to be here, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, so uh, on boarding with Dignity, can you give us uh, a little bit of background on what it is you're talking about? Yes, so a lot of people confuse training and onboarding. So they think they onboard someone by training them. <laughs> and obviously that's not the case. Onboarding is really about integrating people into the organization in a way that they become integrated, not assimilated per se. They're able to retain who they are, their distinct person, um, but be able to work and navigate effectively through the organization with and through people, both formally and informally navigating that organization. And I led associate onboarding at the company when I worked in the organizational effectiveness group. And so I've learned a lot about what not to do <laughs> when you're onboarding people to not make them feel uh, respected. To me, I define dignity as honoring someone through respect and that respect needs to be meaningful to that person. Perfect. So um, can you take us through the process, maybe share the slides you have and put them up and, and let's have a little bit of a, an overview and then uh, we can open up to questions. I am happy to do that. Let me go ahead and share my slides. There we go. I don't think I'm sharing you right now, but there we go. I'll put this in... I'll put this in slideshow mode. I think that people will probably be able to see better if I do that. Can everyone see okay, I assume? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know we're gonna talk about onboarding and development, but I'm a big picture person, and if you're one too, you might wanna see where does that fit in into the bigger picture. So of course, you need to hire a person and train and onboard a person. Sometimes people do that in opposite directions. <laughs> you know, they train first, they onboard later. Um, there's really not a right or wrong, and it depends on the role. Then you develop, retain, and sometimes you have to offboard a person. So you really have to have a holistic approach to the dignified treatment of your employees and, and incorporate that humanistic approach through all six of these pillars. So I'm not going to go into depth on hiring, but onboarding and developing the wrong person is still a lose situation. So we want to make sure that up front, we're considering the strengths of that person, the values that they have, and that those will not be violated by our organizational culture, the skills that that person is motivated to use and energized by, and how their personality is wired. And so in addition to thinking about those four things about the employee that you're looking to bring into your organization, you have to have given some forethought into how does this role fit into the overall team or organization's goals? If that person doesn't understand how they fit into the mission and the vision and the goals of the organization, they are not going to really feel connected 
to, to your vision and to your mission. And so that's so important that you've thought of that so you can help them understand that. And then you have to know what are the specific goals um, and expectations that you have of this person now and, and as things are changing in the organization. Because if you are not clear on your expectations, you're really setting that person up for failure in the role. And then also, what are your expectations in terms of their performance. What does a high performer look like so that they can, can know what those expectations are personally? And you have to consider what are some of the challenges they will face. Are you an organization that's moving to be a more diverse culture? And they might be in the first transgender group of people that are coming into the organization. And what challenges will, that, will they face and how can you support them through those challenges? You can't just think, bring in people with a diversity and inclusion lens and then hope for the best, that they'll, they'll be able to integrate into your culture. So when we talk about onboarding now, we have to, I, I alluded to this already, onboarding is not training. It's really this process of integration. We're not looking to assimilate, we're looking to unify every person retaining their unique brilliance and contributing to the organization's goals. And in order to really onboard, you have to be intentional. So onboarding plans are a great way to be intentional and to accelerate that integration. And I'm gonna show you one shortly. But when you're doing an onboarding plan, you need to incorporate those previous questions that you asked. For example, what are the challenges that person will face? What, are, what is our bathroom situation here? If we have this first transgender person coming here. And how do we support that employee? And if that temporarily means that you close down a bathroom and that employee is the only person who can use it, that needs to be in that onboarding process, as an example. Um, and then also, you want to make sure that you're living out the company values. How many times have you seen organizations have the values on the wall, but the employees would tell you, yeah, respect for the individual, mm, not so much. So we wanna make sure that our onboarding is very intentional in, okay, we say we respect the individual. We say we tell the truth and tell it fast. We say we value uh, ideas and innovation. H how can we incorporate that into our onboarding so that we're really walking that talk? So let's take a look at an overview of what a formal onboarding plan might look like, and then I'll actually show you a graphic of a sample for those visual learners on the call. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to think about what is the length of time that I need? And you want to really think about all the steps you need to take and that's going to dictate how long it is, not, okay, I'm going to just do three weeks and let's see what we can stuff in there. The, the timing is really dictated by the content. So let's just say we have a four week plan, for example. What are the key focus areas for that employee's first 60 to 90 days. And by focus areas, I mean, do they need to build vendor relationships? Do they need to meet all the customers? Do they need to learn the products? Or what is it they need to be focusing on for those 60 to 90 days? And you really wanna establish their top priorities. And three is a good chunk for someone to be able to manage. Too few and they will not be able to really fill their day meaningfully and too many and they'll be overwhelmed and won't know how to prioritize their time. So I just list a few examples here which I won't read to you, but as an example, you're, you're fleshing out the three priorities. So that person knows what they need to accomplish at the end of those 90 days. It's very stressful to join a new organization. So the clearer you can make what you expect that from that person in their first 90 days, the, the more comfortable they're going to feel. And then you want to actually provide a week by week plan, a flexible plan, of course. We're not being rigid, but we're providing some guidance for that person to really feel comfortable. So for example, you have an overview, you are going to build relationships with the team managers, with the peers, and through your direct reports through one-on-one -on -one meetings. That's what we want you to focus on in your first week. And in your second week, we want you to form some relationships with our stakeholders for your key project. And perhaps you're gonna set up a focus group to talk to all of them. And so on and on for each week of the onboarding plan, 
they understand what the overall goal is for that week or goals. There could be more than one goal, but then the plan should outline the actual activities. So I want to show you just, oh, and also not to forget, you can give them a snapshot ahead of what comes beyond 90 days. And you don't necessarily have to set the priorities um, in that moment, but at least give them a snapshot after they're onboarded for that 90 day period, what might come next. So here I wanted to show you a sample onboarding plan and what that must, might look like. So you'll notice here there are five columns. What is the actual task? What's the purpose? People need to know the why behind why they need to be doing this and uh, maybe what's in it for them. <laughs> and then are there meetings to schedule to accomplish that? And who's going to be responsible for it? So many times when people start in an organization, an expectation is, is met, is, is given, but they're not really sure, am I supposed to do that? Or is my manager doing that? And so this really reduces confusion and it enables them to work with autonomy and to feel good about uh, being able to take control of their own position and not feel like they have to sit and wait for direction. And then what, what are some helpful resources you can provide to them? Is there something they can read? Are there team member bios they can look at? Um, is there a training they can take that will really equip them to be successful? So um, Jennifer, do you want me to take questions about all of this at the end or while we go? Um, I think kind of at the end though, I'm, I really like this. I'm thinking to myself like the number of times I've been onboarded and I wasn't really introduced to people. Yeah. Right? You're just given a desk and said, go at it, but you're never actually like there's never a social time to get to know your colleagues enough to even know who you can go to and feel comfortable with to ask questions that will come up. So I love this. That's exactly the point of, of this is you don't want someone to receive an email from you and they're, they have to respond and say, I'm sorry, who are you? That just makes the person sending the email feel terrible. So um, everyone who's a stakeholder has received a copy of this onboarding plan. They're expecting this person to reach out to them. That person feels valued. They feel welcome. They feel that there's forethought in bringing them onto the organization. And you should also have an onboarding plan yourself, not, not the same as this, but what access does this person need in terms of systems? We take for granted the systems we use every day and forget that a new person oh, won't dear. have a username and password. So you have to think about what are, yeah, what are all the things this person will need to make things run smoothly and make them feel valued, okay? So, so the onboarding plan, there is no right or wrong. It's going to be customized to your organization, of course. Um, meetings may never be virtual, but if they are, do you assume this person knows how to use the software? Is it installed? Do they, you know, you want to be thinking ahead of these things and you could put a tutorial to using it in here if, if you're expected to have virtual participants. So anticipating what are the obstacles this person might face and how can I make them feel comfortable? Okay, so that's really the, the biggest key to, to creating an onboarding experience that, that goes well for everyone is really anticipating that person's unique needs. And you will have some general things in the onboarding that go across all associates, but what are the unique needs of this person? Okay, always coming back to the individual. So some of the baseline assumptions we make, we should make, they might not be right assumptions, but we wanna, we wanna remember that employees own their, their careers. They really are the ones that own their careers and drive their careers. And managers are to support that development. They might prompt the discussion, but ultimately they play a support role. You're not trying to, to drive people to want to develop themselves because you're going to have associates who are happy in the role they're in and that's where they want to stay. So employees need to take initiative and we support that initiative and the organization should provide the process and the resources. Now one of the questions that was asked uh, was what if the organization doesn't support development? And that, and that first thing is you have to decide according to your personal values 
um, or the values of your employees, is that a deal breaker for you? Is that a culture that you're willing to stay in? But assuming you will stay there, that's when you have to take control of your own development. And I recommend getting a mentor to do that because you look for a person who's where you want to be and then you use a mentor to help you advance in your career and you don't rely on the formal organization to do that. So I want to talk about human optimization when we're developing people. Our tendency is to think develop and train and that'll fix performance problems that will give development opportunities for people that's the way to get people to the next level that's the way to deal with demotivation but the issue is there are underlying issues behind why people aren't performing well and you don't want to ignore the people who are performing well there's a tendency of managers to ignore the, the top performers and put them on autopilot because they're doing what we want and so we just ignore them so this is a little confusing to understand, but I'm going to explain it. You will see five trees here. On the top, you have two trees that are very leafy with healthy roots. That represents two employees with stronger performance. But you'll notice on the left, one employee is not really wired to do that job, but they are performing well. The person on the right is wired to do that well. And when I say wired, I'm talking about those four pillars we discussed, their strengths, their values, their preferred skills, and their personality. So when you have someone that doesn't have the trait fit for the role, they're just a top performer, they're a superstar, and they're gonna perform well almost anywhere you plug them in. However, it says that you need to take caution because it's not sustainable for that individual. If they are working against their natural gifting and their natural skills, they will burn out. So you want to be having performance conversations about where might they go next or what are opportunities to reshape their role um, so that they know that they have a next step, they have a career path because where they are can't be sustained. And those are the people who just up and quit one day and everyone is shocked because they've just had enough. When someone is performing well and they're wired for it, your strategy for that person from a development standpoint is capitalize. How can I give this person more exposure in the organization? How can I give them stretch projects to help them move to the next level? Can I give them opportunities to mentor other people? So you are rewarding their top performance by creating more opportunity for them and giving them exposure, which will champion them uh, further in their career in the organization. It's not always up the ladder. Not everyone is a ladder climber. Some people want to go deeper in, in an expert career pattern, for example. So now let's shift to the bottom. You'll notice we have varying root systems from healthy root systems to some scraggly ones, but we don't have leafy, robust leaves. So this is illustrating we don't have good performance. We have poor performance in these three cases. Now, in the case where someone is theoretically a good fit, they have the natural strengths um, for that role and they're interested in it, it seems to suit their personality and all of those great things, but they're not performing, that person just needs development. Maybe they're early in their career, maybe they haven't done that role before, maybe you have specific expectations in the organization that they're not familiar with that way of doing things, and so they really need just some development, and that could be mentorship, it could be a formal training program that they need to be sent to. But when someone is moderately a good fit for the role in this middle weak looking tree, <laughs> they need to develop with support. So you might put them through uh, a mentorship program and then they meet one-on-one -on -one with you every other week to support their performance. So they can perform in the role, but they're going to need a little extra support. When someone is not wired for that role and they're not performing well, you can put them on a performance improvement plan and meet with them every week and do all of these things, but you're not going to see an improvement because they're just not capable of doing the work. And you can only compensate a couple of ways. You can rework the role to fit the person, you can delegate some of the things away from them, or you can put them in a brand new role, or you can exit them from the organization. Those are your options. <laughs> so it's really important to get down and diagnose what exactly is going on with my employee.
because simply sending them to training is not going to, to work if they're on the poor trait fit end. Okay. You know, it's, it's really interesting. This last one, um, I worked for a company, uh, and our, our division, my boss was really good at identifying people who were basically failing in other departments and he would take them out of what they were doing and give them a whole new role. And then they'd end up thriving because it was a better trait fit for them. That's so, right. He probably he, has individualization or maximizer in strengths finder. Both of those strengths are able to see talent. So are developers. Those three strengths, they're able to see talent in people and figure out the right role for them. Right. So and that, to me, that's part of dignity, right? Is recognizing yes. the individual not as a failure, but as a, per, as a whole person with strengths that might not be being utilized by the organization at this time. That is absolutely key. We tend to make this assumption when the person isn't performing well, they're lazy, um, they don't care about this, they're a loser, um, they've got stuff going on at home. We start making all these uh, stories in our mind but the reality is most people come to work wanting to do a good job. And if someone is not performing well, we need to reach out to them in a supportive way, in a, in a way that they don't feel threatened. I called an employee that was struggling once and I said, hey, let's talk about how you're feeling about work. Are you feeling demotivated? I want to help you. And she said, yes, I feel so demotivated. And we started to dig into why. And we ended up moving her into another role where she ended up staying in the organization quite happily for another year and a half until she promoted into something else. But we don't want to make assumptions that a person is just, um, they're, they're unskilled, they have nothing to offer, they're lazy or, or whatever, because people do want to do a good job and it's very stressful for them when they can't. So thank you for pointing that out. We're, we have a bunch of questions and um, we're about 20 minutes in. So, um, Elizabeth, do you want to open it up to some of the questions we've got? Um, sure. I'm so um, Robbie uh, has said um, experience is situated all around us and doesn't arise only from within. Even if one is well intentioned, organizational culture can inhibit diversity, inclusion, and belongingness. How does one change toxic organizational or societal cultures? That is a great question and a huge problem. <laughs> and one of the reasons that these toxic workplace cultures happen is we value results over people. So if you have a person who is a demonstrated performer and they're getting great results, their behavior is excused. Uh, they, they're, they're stepping all over people to get ahead. The um, berating people in meetings. And there is a lot of research that shows that those behaviors, even though that person is affecting the financial bottom line through their results, they're actually tearing down the organization and that organization is losing uncalculated dollars. So there, there is a financial um, case for not supporting those types of behaviors. So going back to the culture change, First, people have to get real and honest about what type of culture you're in. So there are four types of workplace cultures. You have defensive workplace cultures. That's kind of like the post office, not to pick on any culture in particular, but it's very command and control. Communication is almost non-existent. And when it is, it's top down. People are fleeing the organization um, in the upper levels, like prison break style. And and it's a finger pointing culture and it's only a matter of time until you're blamed for something. Then when you move up in the pyramid, you have something called a paternalistic culture. Now we have great intentions. We're gonna treat our, ch our children very well. We're mom and dad and we tell you only the good news and we take care of you and we have fun things to do here like ping pong and we feed you lunch but we don't tell you about bad news. You have no authority to make decisions in your role because we're gonna take care of you and make you happy. Adults don't like to be treated like children. So it seems very enticing to go into a culture like that where they're taken care of, but ultimately people want to be able to have some autonomy over their work. 
The third workplace culture is what we call an open culture. Now that becomes a flat culture and everyone's really excited to contribute, lots of great ideas, communications flowing up and down. Everyone has an opportunity to, to generate ideas in that flat organization, but there's no systems or structure or process because you tend to see this in startup cultures and everyone burns out after 18 months. <laughs> and so it's not sustainable. The ultimate culture you're looking for is an open or collaborative culture where communication is top down. You still retain that feeling of the flat organization where everyone is treated with respect. Everyone has a voice. It's not this authoritative kind of top down culture. However, everyone also knows what to expect because you have clear processes and procedures and a, a developed human resources function. And so you have the best of both worlds of the flat culture with a more organized um, structure. And organizations will rotate in and out of these cultures. They don't stay at open and say, oh, we can rest now. Here we are, we made it. You know, because you can easily dip back down into that defensive culture if you're not being intentional about retaining the, that culture through building trust encouraging healthy conflict, uh, coming to agreement, when we're able to come to agreement around health. Um, everyone is able to contribute and have their voice heard and you get results because people are account held accountable. If you don't create that kind of a culture, uh, it, it's not, you'll never reach it and you won't maintain it. It's, it's really interesting what you just said about, you know, the paternalistic versus the authoritative uh, but but co uh, collaborative. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with different parenting styles, but there's you know the two two really bottom ones are neglect and permissiveness. Yeah, which results in kids that are truly ethical. I mean, the, they grow up into adults and they'll form an ethical system for themselves, but it's not good for the kid. And then there's two poorly named ones. One is authoritarian, and the other is authoritative. Mm -hmm. And they're completely different. And the authoritarian is kind of like what you just said, the paternalistic, where it's very controlling, where mm -hmm. authoritative is you do have a decision maker to help, you know, keep things organized. But the relationship between parent and child is more collaborative as yeah. opposed to controlling, um, exactly. where the child does have autonomy and the right to have input and the right to ask questions and to challenge the authority of the parent and, so forth, which freaks a lot of people out, but it sounds like these four four work environments kind of map. <laughs> they do. Class. They do. You're exactly right. And you have multiple subcultures within a culture. So you can have a paternalistic culture that has an open and collaborative culture on a particular team because of a particular manager. You can also have an open culture that has that paternalistic culture because of a particular team. So it's so important, these, these performance reviews just drive me crazy that are top down and the managers to the, to the employees, but the employees have no voice in, in saying what their experience is, ha is in the organization. And it's just, it's that top down thing. Elizabeth, do we have another question? Oh yeah, we have quite a few. Um, so uh, one question for Kristen is, uh, what constitutes dignity at work apart from the respect piece? Or can you dig into that a little bit more? So I think that peop there are a couple of parts um, to, to do with this. So I think dignity also means people need to be seen and heard. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people not only need, you know, the onboarding plan is great. You've got your stapler, you've got your access, you've got your desk, like you have the basic needs met, but people need to feel that the relationships and the belonging. So you can treat people respectfully, um, but they don't feel seen and they don't feel heard. And so I think that that's also an element that needs to be incorporated in that because you can look and say, well, no one's treating me disrespectfully, but I don't feel seen and heard and that's a basic human need it's it sounds too like this idea of belonging that part of the a humanistic onboarding would be to help the employee as quickly as possible feel like they're a valued member of the team that people know who they are and are happy that this person joined the team like that would to me be the ideal whenever i join a new organization right is 
you know, you go in, are people going to like me? It's like the first day of school and, and helping facilitate those relationships would be an important part of the onboarding. I, I mean, that's absolutely right. So many people focus on process but 90% of problems in organizations are people problems. They're not problems with the tools, with the technology. It's, it's problem with the people, right? So that's not where we're investing our time. We're like, okay, you need to know all of our products and all our services and read all these documents on the intranet. And <laughs> that, that's, that's really not, we're, we're doing a disservice to people by um, focusing on all the processes and not on the people. The people problems are what people are going to have. Great. Um, and I was going to unmute um, PJ because they, uh, they, she, they had had uh, an experience that they wanted to share. PJ, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I, was just, I was just eating lunch, so I didn't want to, you know, um, have my picture up. But, um, the funniest thing when you mentioned about the prison break um, <laughs> exiting and I thought that is hilarious because one time I did have a I did have a situation where I seriously left the organization in the middle of a holiday party like I had a friend come and remove everything from my office that I had packed up previously right and she took everything down to my car I took my dishes, you know, from the holiday party when we were done, you know, I went down to my car and I left, um, but not before I left my letter of resignation with my supervisor, her supervisor, and the chief judge, right? Because it was with the court system. And so um, it just made me laugh so hard because I never thought about it as a prison break. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was so funny that um, that's exactly how I left that, that organization. And, uh, you know, I was young. I didn't know what else to do. I was like, I can't take this anymore and just had to go. But it was really the finger pointing culture, you know, and at some point everything was my fault. Mm. Yeah. I ended up getting a very nice check from them to uh, <laughs> all the time I had worked and not been paid for, but oh. yet everything was my fault that went wrong. Um, mm -hmm. so it was just, I just wanted to comment on that because I thought it was so funny, the prison break. Yeah. The majority of people, the, the number one culture, at least in the United States is the paternalistic. It's the most common workplace culture. Yeah. We're going to take care of you and we're going to treat you like children and only tell you the good news. Yeah. Oh, my husband worked for a company like that a little while back and he, he just couldn't stand it. It's just mm -hmm. horrible. <laughs> Elizabeth, other questions? And Sherry, can you um, stop sharing the screen so that we can see? Sure. Um, yeah, so one of the um, questions was uh, this notion of balancing, because at the end of the day, work still has to get done, right? So how do we balance positive affirmational concepts like dignity and flourishing and engagement with efficiency and other more bottom line concepts that senior, senior leaders are looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, I'm dropping things over here. That's a great question. I really do believe that leaders don't, a good leader anyway, doesn't necessarily care on the means to the end as long as we're getting the results. But I use something called the five questions whenever I was working with my teams. And that, did I put the five questions in here? Because that might be, I don't think I did. But I use a five question strategy to make sure that I am, hearing and including my employees, but also it's very result oriented. So, and you can apply these five, five questions to strategic planning, to any question in the organization. How are we doing as an organization? How are we doing with diversity and inclusion? Um, how are we doing with our onboarding process? You can point these questions to anything and it's what's going well, and it's a positive focused question to look at what can we continue to leverage in the organization that's going well, what needs to be done differently, better, or more of. And you, you in this process, you're hearing people out, you're including them in the dialogue. Uh, every manager should be doing this with their employees. 
And it's a safe way to surface problems when you ask them, what do we need to be doing differently, better, or more of? And then you need to ask them, what are the barriers to those improvements? Because if you don't surface barriers, then those improvements can never happen because the barrier is always going to be an obstacle. And then what's one thing that we need to change helps focus on the most important priority and how can you help? It gives people ownership when you ask the person, how could you help? And now, of course, you're going to share how you're going to help too, but how can you help makes them feel part of the process and part of the solution. It gives them ownership and people want to feel like owners in the organization. So you're using a soft strategy to really get to the heart of the issues with your employees but it, it's very result focused because you, you can create an actual action plan out of that. So it's not just a fuzzy discussion. Tell me, tell me what's making you sad, <laughs> right? Um, how, so I'm interested in one of our um, listeners is what it, what, how does one measure or appraise the employee dignity component in an organization? So is there a metric or a KPI that you use, you know, to assess the onboarding process, for example? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of using focus groups and then surveys. So um, you go into a focus group and you could even use those questions that I just gave you, in fact, for your focus group. There's a focus group in a box. But the biggest issues with organizations is they assume what problems are. And they'll say, you know what? Our employees aren't engaged. We need to give a gift to, their, to employees to make them feel like we value them. And they say, we're going to give, gift, we're gonna give um, gym memberships to everyone. And 50% of your organization is African-American and lives in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. And they will tell you that people don't put gyms in African-American neighborhoods and now you have completely um, not given access to this gift because uh, half of your employees uh, in this call center are going to have to try and find a bus to be able to get to this gym and you you're not being inclusive in that so when you have focus groups you can really get down to what are we doing well because you know diversity as an example in this case is not always what you see you have people who feel marginalized because of the generation that they're in or because of their belief system or um, because they're remote workers. And so it's not always something that you can see. So when you have a focus group, you actually get the voice of the employee. What are we doing well here that we can do more of? And where are some, where, where are some things that you do not feel included, you do not feel thought of, um, and you feel marginalized by, you will not know through your lens. So you really need the voice of the employee. And then after you do the focus groups, then you can start to create prioritization and plans on what are some of the low effort, high impact things that we can do now so people can see we are acting on and we're communicating with people. So people don't wanna get their voice heard and you do nothing with it. That's almost worse than asking. <laughs> you know, than, than not asking at all. So then once you start implementing, then maybe once a year, every other year, you start to do some sort of an anonymous survey. Here's what, here's what our commitments were to you. These were the three clear goals of what we're trying to do to make this a more inclusive culture or a more dignified culture. And you're having regular communications. The other thing that you need to do is create ambassadors in the organization. So anytime you have any type of an organizational change, 60% of the people are neutral, 20% of the people are gonna be naysayers, and 20% are gonna be cheerleaders. You have to identify that 20% cheerleaders and, and then they'll drag that 60% neutral group so you have 80% support for whatever it is you're trying to do to implement after you have the focus group. And then you're gonna actually have some success of implementing some change and you measure it through associate surveys. But the important thing is you have to share your results, the good, bad, and the ugly. And you have to make commitments to, to the change and, and have regular communication, not just survey people and then crickets and they don't hear anything for a year. I get really passionate about that topic in case you didn't notice. <laughs> That's one of those um, don'ts, right? <laughs> yes, you hit on one of my don'ts. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, you're still sharing your screen, so uh, if you can. Oh, sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. Um, so Elizabeth, do we have some more questions? We are um, about. Uh, yeah, no, I let me do a little housekeeping really quick. Um, we are about. We're at twelve forty right now. Um, if you are participating because you want to get uh, an HRCI or SHRM or general certificate or all three or two or whatever, um, now is the time that you can start adding your email and your name so that we put it on the certificate and which certificates, plural, you want. Um, and that way we'll make sure you get those at the end. And again, this is through my company, Humanist Learning System, so I need your name, your email, and which certificates you want, HRCI, SHRM, or general. So, Elizabeth? Um, yeah, so uh, one thing, uh, Shelly, I'll ask, or um, Kristen, can you add, put the um, five questions into the um, chat box? Sure. Uh, and and uh, because uh, Sh uh, Shelly's asking for them. So, uh, and then I'm going to open up to um, Bavia uh, and unmute her, but uh, as I'm doing that, I'll say her question um, that she wants to know uh, which are some of the most significant leader or organizational values required to support a dignity oriented culture. Um, Bavia, do you want to say more about that? Yeah, so. Uh like uh, when we talk about the Schwartz um, values, uh, you know, we talk about all of these leadership values like self-direction and self-enhancement. But, uh, you know, what we have uh, read about self-transcendent values actually relate to this concept of dignity very well. But again, that is very bookish. Like, you know, you are a you have you know practiced it and you understand the practicality of it so i wanted to understand that in practice what are those organizational values which draw people towards you know and aligns their goals and their uh, you know their own individual values to the leadership values and the organizational values that's a question for me Okay, so values are very personal. So interestingly, even when you put a value on the wall, another person views that value differently. <clears throat> so you not only have to put the value, but what does the expression of that value look like? If we value telling the truth and telling it fast, what does that look like? Well, when we make a mistake, what do we do? When we discover a problem for a customer, how do we handle that? So people need to know what the value looks like in practice. And so you are going to see certain values that organizations hold that attract certain types of people. And I've had people say to me, well, isn't that a bad thing? You're creating group think, you're creating. And I'm like, no, if I value community and you value community, we can still be very different people and, and manifest differences in other ways, but shared values are actually a good thing in an organization. You want, because that's how you actually get the unity. We all believe in respect. We all believe in being honest. We all believe in creating community because if you don't have those shared values, you can't accomplish those goals. So I would say that it really starts with the organization having, and I hate to use the, the term branding, but they really, they really need to go through a branding exercise of what do we represent and how do we want people to perceive us? Because a lot of organizations pick values that sound good on the wall, but they don't actually think about how do we want to be known by our customers, by our employees, and then how do we demonstrate those values so that we can show employees a picture of what that actually looks like. And anyone who's thinking of joining an organization really needs to research the values, but then also speak to people in the organization to say, how do you see this organization operationalizing these values? Can you give me examples of how respect for the individual is demonstrated on a regular basis in this organization? And if people struggle to answer those questions, you know, that if you value that, the organization only values it in name only. And um, you. if you do find yourself in that situation, what um, is there anything that uh, you can do to be a change maker within an organization that isn't developmental? Um, yeah, absolutely. So when you say developmental, you mean developing yourself or others? 
or both? Both, that they don't have a culture of, you know, being either they're paternalistic and they said, you don't need to worry about that, we'll take care of you, or that they're um, thwarting it because they like the results they're getting, um, the, the toxic culture for whatever reason. Yeah, so, so I would say that you need to pilot and document your own results that you're looking for. So whatever change you're trying to make, you need to, to make it within your own locus of control, right? Like with your direct reports, your team. And you might look at other case studies and other organizations that have done interventions similar to what you're trying to do or the change that you're trying to make. And then you really need to make a case. What results came from that? Um, did turnover decrease? Did employee engagement increase? Did profits increase? Did customer satisfaction increase? Did safety incidents go down? Like what are some of the things for, you could create your own little case study or present case studies to your organization. But before you present what change you're trying to make, you need to find your ambassadors. That, that's what I was talking about earlier. Who are the 20% who are on board and interested in supporting you? And you could meet with them in advance. And how are you willing to help? And how could we do this? That way, when you're going and trying to make change in your organization, whether it's to your director or your VP or whoever you're presenting to, you are sharing the actual results from your own case study or the case study of other interventions that you've researched. You're sharing the what's in it for them. Here's how safety incidents went down. Here's how engagement went up. Here's how profits increased from making these types of changes in organizations. And here are the people who I already have gotten on board to help and support this mission. So-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and here's how they're willing to help. And so now you have this army of people, and it's not just you who, who are willing to roll up their sleeves and make this change that you're trying to make. But you can't just go in and say, oh, I have this great idea. I read this in a book. <laughs> You're not going to get any buy-in. So you really are trying to create as many, many pillars of support as you can. Here's the research. Here's the data. Here's the what's in it for you. And here's some champions who are already willing to help. And here's a roadmap of what we might do. Make it easy for people to say yes. Okay, so then the, to summarize, then I heard three things there. One is to have the idea that you've found through literature or reading, then a case of where it worked and how it was implemented so as a data point for, yes, this is actually a good idea. And then to build allies within the organization before you pitch it as an initiative uh, so that you've already got that support to help galvanize it. Absolutely. And you always want to present the what's in it for that person. So think about the person you're presenting to. Are they a dominance driven personality? They're going to care about results. Are they an influencing type of extroverted person? They're going to care about creating collaboration. Are they a conscientious person? They're going to care about that this is the right thing to do, the accurate thing to do, the precise thing to do. Or are they a supportive person? So they're going to care, how, how will we create stability? How will we bring people in? So you have to consider the person you're pitching to and actually meet the preferences of that person. Because a pitch the same way to different personality types will fall flat. If you say, wow, this is going to get people so excited around here and create a lot of community, and you're talking to a dominance-driven person, well, what results am I going to get from that? So that's really what's important to that okay, person. So the the fourth thing then would be the framing of it. Your, the framing of the messaging based yes. on how the person is wired to receive information. What's the message and what's the tone of that message based on, and the content, based on who my audience is? Um, okay, so I don't see anything else. People are typing in their uh, certificate information. Um, Jen, do you have any questions you'd like to? Yeah, um, I think we just talked about, you know, there's always kind of, two dichotomies, right? One is the organization. How do we fix organizational culture? But the other part is how do we do this for ourselves? So if I've gone into a company and they're failing me with the onboarding, <laughs> I'm not introducing me to people and all the stuff that they should be doing. They're doing all the don'ts. How can I take ownership of my own onboarding to kind of make up for that and maybe help change the culture for the future by being proactive as an individual? Yeah, and that's a really great question because I think a lot of times people just suffer in silence. Um, anytime, there's research around this. A friend of mine wrote this great book called The Hard Talk Handbook, How to Have the Difficult Conversations That Make a Difference. 
And one of the pieces of research she had in there is that 70% of people will not speak up in a situation where they should speak up. And I remember coaching this woman who was onboarded onto a new team. And I was brought in to do coaching with these new managers. And she told me that two weeks had gone by and she, her manager never even came by her desk or talked to her. She had nothing to do. She was just sitting there for two weeks. I said, what have you been doing? Oh, I'm just trying to read things and learn everything I can. And, and I said, why didn't you say anything? And she said, well, I know they're really busy. Okay, so <laughs> the first thing is, is you have to be your own advocate. You have to speak up for what you need because you can't assume that people know what you need. And so think about that. What are the things that I need? And then create that list of things that you need. And then you want to say, hey, do you think we could set up a weekly one-on-one -on -one, uh, throughout my onboarding process where I can bring um, what's going well and some of the challenges I'm having and ask you questions? You should really be meeting regularly with your manager but speak up. Even if you're not meeting one-on-one, -on -one, what's the vehicle to be speaking up? I mean, it's just, ugh, those situations are just unreal. But if you are in that situation, not only do you need to speak up and, and let people know what you need, but you need to constructively give feedback. And that's difficult for people to do, but there's a simple framework to say, here are some things that I've observed. So I, I, I don't have access to this software and there's nowhere I can go to the bathroom or wh whatever the situations are. And here is the impact that's had. People really know the, need to know the impact. A lot of times people just say the problem, but if you don't share the impact, it kind of gets lost on people. And then um, I'm, you know, I'm concerned because or whatever, but share that impact. And then how can I help is a great question to ask. I know you're busy. How can I help? What can I proactively give you? And hopefully when you are sharing the impact that they're dropping the ball is having and you're approaching it in that humble way without being like, oh my gosh, you guys don't have it together around here. I can't get on my computer. I can't get in the break room, da, da, da. And when you approach people with how can I, can I, can I help? Um, should I be giving you a list of things I need? Um, hopefully that spurs that person to realize like, oh, yikes, I'm not doing a good job here. And we like to think that people, it wasn't intentional, right? That they wanted to do a good job. They just don't know what you need. So, but as far, but in general, I would say um, when you find yourself in a situation and you're struggling, you really need to look at what your own blind spots are and what am I not doing well? You want to start there. What am I, what am I, what could I be doing better myself? And you know, what are tools and resources that I can leverage? And I think that even though that's a terrible situation to be in, that you feel like people have forgotten about you, you can really grow and learn a lot. And then you can bring those learnings back. So here, here is an organized document that I'm providing to you, a, a spreadsheet. Here are all the things that, that I didn't have that I needed or situations that came up. And then you can provide that to them in an organized manner so they can use it to onboard the next person. It's very solutions focused. I really, I really like that. Um, one of the things you had mentioned at the beginning had to do with um, the onboarding having set expectations. And a lot of those expectations had to do with knowledge, what my mom would call knowledge ac acquisition. Um, and pretty much every job I've taken on you know, it's a couple months before I'm actually producing because mm -hmm. the first couple months are knowledge acquisition months. I can't right. really contribute and produce until I have enough knowledge to be able to do so. And having that knowledge acquisition be explicit um, as what, what you are expected to do during the onboarding, I think would be really helpful because I know um, I feel like I'm failing because I'm not producing yet, even though I am being productive with knowledge acquisition. Right. And my mom does the same thing and she's expressed the same thing. It's really nerve wracking when you can't <laughs> produce because you're in knowledge acquisition phase. But if that's the expectation and it makes it okay yes. you know, that we expect you to be in knowledge acquisition for a month or two and we need you to tell us you know, what you need so that you can move from knowledge acquisition to production, um, I think would be a helpful part of the onboarding. 
I agree. I had a manager once who actually said to me, I don't expect you to really be competent in your knowledge of this job until about six months. That was really helpful because I was working in a really complex reimbursement uh, environment in healthcare. So yeah, setting that expectation. We're, you're not here to do right now. Your job is to just orient yourself, to get to build relationships. Like that is adding value. The people that. who are wired to be doers, just that's hard for them that they're not contributing, especially if you have like an achiever orientation to yourself. Yeah, well, I think that's everybody though, right? You want to do well. Like you were saying, most people, no one goes into a job thinking, gee, today I'm going to be crappy, right? Yeah. Everybody, everybody wants to do good and then we feel helpless because we can't produce because we don't even know where the paper, where we're supposed to file paperwork with, you know? Like right. we haven't met that person yet, so we can't. Um, and it's, it's frustrating, but it's helpful to know that that is expected as part of the learning process. So, yeah. And that's something that you could explicitly put in the expectations, the overall expectations. Our expectation is for you to be a learner in these 90 days, not a doer. <laughs> okay. right. Man, that would be so frustrating though. Like I'd be, what? <laughs> It really is. Some people aren't going to handle that information well regardless, but at least it helps them with the guilt because you can remind them of that. <laughs> but I'll, um, I'll just give you another tip. Like I did three things to try and help my people, not from the knowledge acquisition point of view, but in terms of, of onboarding, I had a 30 minute meeting with every person and I actually wrote down the questions. Um, how do you prefer to be communicated with? What motivates and demotivates you at work? What do you value most from your manager? What's one thing about you that you feel comfortable sharing with me? And what's one thing you have to say feel comfortable? And what's one thing that you want to know about me? Those are five great questions to ask a new employee to really start to build a trust bond that they feel that you care about them. You're not just like, okay, I'm gonna train you on this, that, or the other. But those are pretty personal questions without crossing a line. And then I would do assessments with people to find out their strengths and values. What's important to you? How do you like to be, when I say assessment, it's not necessarily formal, but what are the things that you're, that you're really good at and enjoy? How do you like to be recognized? Um, those types of questions. And I would give them a little form to complete, to, to share how they like to be communicated with, how they like to be recognized. So I could go and pull it out of this electronic folder and just quickly read it before I recognize them to make sure it was on point. Um, and we did have one, I know we're almost a time boundary, but we had one good question. I thought, um, how did, does this onboarding process differ in a contract environment versus a regular employee? So um, did you have any experience with that you could speak to? That's, that's really challenging because inherently cultures set up this us against them culture. So, okay, employees, you're all invited to this. This is not for contractors. And so right from the start, people feel like they don't have that sense of belonging. So I think you really need to set your intentions. Some organizations can't have contractors be treated the exact same way as employees because of the type, the nature of the industry it is, or it might not be appropriate for what they have access to. But I think what's really most important there is setting the intention. How do we want our contractors to feel? When someone comes into this organization as a contractor, what, are, what do we want them to feel? And let's verb those values. We want them to feel affirmed, to feel um, accepted, to feel valued. Like, what do we want to do? And then what are the actual behaviors that we're going to implement into our plans to make, so you've really got to verb those values. And if you don't set the intention, is there a difference between contractors and employees? Maybe there isn't. And then we're, we're intentioned in how we onboard them so that they have the same experience as the employee. But if you don't set the intentions and set the behaviors linked to those intentions based on your values, they will automatically feel like outsiders. But it's, it is challenging because everybody has this, well, you're temporary attitude. So I'm not trying to make it sound like that's a simple solution. Right. Well, I want to thank you, Kristen, uh, for joining us today. And for everybody online, her book is called UMAP. And you should go out and buy it. <laughs> 
a lot of the stuff she's talking about is in the book um, and she is working, she tells me, on one for managers. That's right. Can I tell you a little secret? Yes. Is tomorrow the 25th? Yes. May 25th, 26th. Is it the 27th too? I know this weekend it's 99 cents on Kindle on Amazon. Woohoo! My publisher put it on sale starting tomorrow for two days. Oh, that's awesome. Well, timing is everything. The 25th then. and the 26th. So you're, the timing just happened to be perfect for you guys. It wasn't planned, but maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> there you go.